Skyletine was one of the very first sources of psychoeducation that was online, period. Uh, about the time that that came up, there was really nothing else. Um, in the years since then, there's been more and more, but a Scarletine as it exists right now is, we kind of call it a sex ed web clearinghouse. There's thousands of uh, advice columns and articles with static content. We also have direct services, so people can come in and directly ask us questions. We have a text hotline. We have a moderated message board. We also do a live chat service as well. Um, we do outreach services as well in person. We write books. We've always done it in a way that was a little different than how other people were doing it. We were inclusive from the very beginning. We were pleasure-oriented from the very beginning. So we never said to anybody, for instance, that we're going to give them all of this information about sex, but they really shouldn't be having any. Right, so Scarlet Letters was a site that was about sexuality that was mostly focused around women. And the reason that we wound up starting Scarletine is by virtue of being one of the first things online to talk about sex at all. I was saying this morning in another class, I think with how much pornography is on the internet now, everybody might have the idea that there's always been that much pornography on the internet. And actually in the early days of the internet, there was still barely even any porn. Um, so it's not even like... So we had to put some there. Right. So we put some smut up and we put some uh, education and some information up as well. Uh, and Scarletine pretty much happened because young people that would go online looking for information about sex, we were one of the only things that they would find. Like, I'd like to say it was because we were so fantastic, but I actually think that mostly it's because we were the only people there. So they were stuck with us. Um, and so they wrote letters in asking sex advice questions. And, uh, and as I recall, we were also very frustrated that a lot of other sites that had adult content would have these little, you know, mm. gatekeeping clickies on their front page that would say, are you 18 or, or over? And if you click the no, I'm under 18, instead of taking you to some, anything that had any kind of sex information, which is clearly what somebody is coming to a sexually related website is looking for, they would send our um, our underage visitors to Disney, you know, like Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon, um, yeah. which you know, I'm 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 a big a fan of slime and other things <laughs> like that, and SpongeBob as as the next girl. But really, if what I want to know is how to prevent STDs, that's right. not really a fantastic resource. Right. So um, so that was also part of our. Um, what we were doing, and, if, and at first, Scarlet Team was just a couple pages. Right. Yeah, five. I think that we started with five, very naively thinking that five would be the supplement to sex ed that would fill in, you know, all of everything else that someone was getting somewhere, which was, there wasn't an all of everything else. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we, after starting Scarlet Team, Scarlet Letters only really lasted another couple of years because Scarlet Teen just kind of snowballed on top of itself. You know, a couple letters a week would be 20 letters a week, would be 50 letters a week, would be a couple hundred letters a week. Um, and so, uh, you know, I at a certain point, I was teaching a three to six classroom during the day. So I was going to a classroom with 30 very energetic three to six year olds and then coming home to my apartment at night and trying to cope because I, you know, I was the designer, I was the coder, I was the marketing person, I was the, most of the jobs were mine. Um, staying up until the wee hours doing this and then dragging my butt out of bed at seven o'clock in the morning to try and still have energy to deal with a lot of bouncing small children. So a choice, a choice had to be made. And Eventually. at the same time, you know, there started to be more um, intelligent sex content for grownups online as well. So, um, so Scarlet Letters really didn't have as much of a market um, or was sharing its market with more and more and more people. Right. But still nobody else was doing what Scarletine did and does. Um, eventually, you know, Planned Parenthood kind of got there and put up some sex education information. Well, they, yeah, there was a whole, it's gone, it's long gone, but Planned Parenthood for three years had a teen website. It didn't last.
You mentioned that you were teaching a three to six classroom when we started Scarletine. So what was your background before that? I mean, I know a lot of our students um, kind of wonder, okay, so I'm, I'm here getting this really fancy, shiny degree from this really fancy, shiny school. Um, and at some point I will be kicked out of the nest and have to go and, you know, get a job with it. Um, so what did you need to know in order to become the Empress of Scarletine? Apparently I needed to drop out. Um, <laughs> I'm a dropout. Um, you know, I think it's interesting when I, when I kind of look back at stuff, it's not super surprising. My father was an activist. My mother is a public health person. You know, I'm kind of what you get when you put my parents in a blender. Um, when I went to high school, I was the only one that everyone knew was having sex. And so everyone came to me with their sex questions. I'm sure I answered most of them really poorly. And so I will like endlessly apologize to all of my fellow students in high school for my really shoddy amateur sex ed that I no doubt was giving everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, but I think that a lot of the reason that people were talking to me then was that I didn't have a problem talking about sex. My mother was very uncomfortable talking about sex. My father was maybe a little too comfortable talking about sex. Um, and so again, you kind of get an average in the middle there. Um, and you know, even when I was in the three to six classroom, any time that there was something that came up, and it's funny because I didn't do this yet, right? That it was something that you had to talk about, about body parts, or somebody had questions about something that could be sex. I remember one time the school I was teaching at was in, was on campus of a college, and there was a playground, and there was a used condom in the playground. And I had come out, and all of the kids were standing in a circle around something, and all of the other teachers said, oh, Heather, you have to go over there. And I thought, I don't even know what it is. Is it a dead bird? What is it? It was always, everything gross was kind of a sign to me, and I went over, and there it is, the used condom, and I said very quickly, oh God, it's a balloon, and someone spit in it, don't touch that, back away, because, you know, I mean, it's, as we even learn with scarletine, and those aren't three to six-year-olds, not every parent is ready and willing for you to have candid conversations with their child about how things really are, and also no one wants to touch a spitty balloon, so, you know, you're all going to be <laughs> safe there. Yeah, so, you know, you were, you were one, I, and, you know, and I, I helped in my small way with this, but you were really one of the first or maybe the first person doing sex positive That's true. Um, sex education online. And, you know, not doing the, you know, here's the information, but you, you, you don't do it um, routine. And also it was always, you know, from the start, it's been, it's been queer inclusive, it's been trans inclusive, it's been genderqueer and non-binary inclusive. And so, but being the first is, is hard. You know, you've, I don't think that you sometimes even realize. All right. <laughs> you know, just how, just how big of a difference sure. that was. Because, you know, I remember in the early days, we were just kind of making it up as we went, right? Because right? it didn't exist. Um, but now, you know, 20 years on, um, what are the, pluses and minuses of being a pioneer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the other day I was having a conversation with another grassroots person and one of the things that we were talking about that really kind of sucked, and I know that you understand this too, is that when you're in the front of something, you're the person who, has, who does all the heavy lifting to normalize a thing, right, and to make a thing more and more culturally accepted and to be the person that kind of takes all of the you know, you fight all the fights first. Everybody's coming at you first. You don't really have other people around. And then you also, you're not going to get any of the funding because nobody's ready to give you funding because you're just some weirdo doing stuff in a way that nobody's doing it. So it's probably not okay. And then, you know, after you do all of that, it, it's a good thing in some ways. It clears the road for other people to be able to do it without having to have all of those fights, without having to be stalked or harassed or to go through all of these things that a lot of us have to go through. But it's also easier for those people to then, somebody that comes in five years after you've normalized something can 
write for a grant for something that they'll get five years after that if you had written it at the beginning, there's absolutely no way that you'd get it. They can be supported. I mean, the other thing too is that we've over the years, when we've seen new people come in, we'll say, welcome, how can we help you? How can we support you? And it would have been very nice <laughs> to have somebody to say, welcome, how can we help you? How can we support you? Instead of largely doing it alone. You know, and I think with us too, because we were being very experimental in it, there's a lot of hits that we took. You know, if we aired, and of course we, aired, you know, of course we did. We aired all the time. There's definitely some things that we chose to do that, in hindsight, I would say those were amazing. That was completely fantastic. There's some other things maybe that we tried. No, they <laughs> were not so amazing or so fantastic, or even in hindsight that I'll cringe a little bit at. But you know, there's no, again, there was really no community for us to be walking into, or no basis of comparison to say, well, we're thinking about doing it this way. Let's look at how all of these other people are doing it, because there really, there wasn't all of these other people. Yeah, and because for us, I mean, Scarletine has always been very, uh, the content's always been very user driven. Um, what we created and what you all still create with Scarletine is really pushed by the questions that come in and the emails that you get and the texts that you mm -hmm. that you get. And so, um, you know, I remember one of the things that we got incessantly when we started out was the the emails that would say, "I did such and such a thing with my partner. Am I still a virgin?" Right. Um, because it was the heyday of abstinence-only education, sex education, um, where in public schools, at least, public schools could not legally um, teach comprehensive sex education in the United States. And um, so we got all of these questions where people were basically trying to ask us, have I had sex? Right. Um, so, you know, so we had to respond to that. That's actually where my book, um, Virgin, the Untouched History, came out of that avalanche of questioning because I didn't, you know, I, there's, there wasn't a good definition for wh what a virgin was or wasn't, and I didn't really know how to respond to it, so I started doing research, and that's when I discovered that there wasn't really an answer um, to that question, except, I don't know, do you want to be? Right. Um, and so... You know, so being so um, client-focused and so driven by the clients, I think it w was always an asset, but also really hard because it meant that people could ask us anything and we had to try and figure out how to respond. Um, and it pushed us in all kinds of ways. Sure. Um, well, I think the extra thing there too is that so frequently we were the only person anyone could identify anywhere where they felt safe asking a question. Right. So also with someone like that too, if they came in and we answered them and they felt good about our answer, there would be 20 more questions, you know, and while there's still all of these other people that are still coming in that also have 20 more questions. Um, I think there was a lot of secretiveness is the other thing, I think for so many of our users, and of course this is also before it was really easy to track what people were doing online, yeah. right? Like now it's real easy, but it was, I mean, literally you'd have to sit, browsers didn't even usually save histories at that point, so you would have things cached, but there are a lot of people that they were not telling their parents uh, that they were accessing this information at all. And so there was kind of, yeah, it was kind of a weird dynamic sometimes to just kind of be in this little code of secrecy. Yeah. So I'm curious, since I haven't been involved in, with Scarlet Teen in quite some time, um, what's changed about the kinds of questions that you get? I mean, I'm sure there are trends. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a few things. I think that, you know, one thing is, is that when we first started Scarlet Teen, our user base was a lot younger. You know, I think the over the years, we've just kept expanding the age. When we went in, we kind of, I mean, it's Scarletine, because the, the site that we had called Scarlet Letters, one of the first users, I wish I remember her name, I feel so bad that I don't, said, you need the Scarletine. And we were like, okay, there it is. Um, but uh, then I think we said, it's teenagers. And then, you know, kind of everybody's experience of adolescence 
culturally kept kind of widening and expanding. And so first of all, it's a much bigger age group. You know, now we generally say 15 to 30 is who we serve, even though then I think we would have said, you know, 14 to 18, something really narrow. Um, and so we definitely get a wider scope of questions. I mean, we get questions from people who have gotten married. When Scarletine first started too, it very much was only in the United States, but within the first five years, after those first five years rather, that radically changed. Right now, maybe 35% of our traffic is the United States. And so just the, the kind of cultural education that we all have to be giving ourselves all the time so that we can answer questions from different places with any kind of cultural sensitivity um, is really complicated. So for instance, you know, if we get a question about whether or not, if you're supposed to bleed the first time you have intercourse, if it proves that you're a virgin or not, the conversation that we might have with somebody in the United States about that, where the consequences of what happens, uh, the stakes are not very high, are gonna be very different than when somebody's writing us from Pakistan asking that question. You know, in the United States, I'm, cultural, I'm comfortable saying, virginity is a really stupid social construct. Why would you even believe in that thing? But to say that to someone in a culture where vir virginity and who's a virgin and what's gonna happen when you get married is very, very deeply embedded into culture and you don't, you can't just, say, I don't believe in that thing. You can't give the, the same question the same answer. So that's changed. You know, I think when you talked earlier about kind of starting at the dawn of abstinence only, you know, now we're on the other side of it. Where we're dealing with kind of what it created and what it largely created was a whole bunch of people who have a lot of internalized shame and are having to work through having all of that internalized shame and fear when they're choosing to have sex lives that's, you know, sex lives that they want to be having, but that in those sex lives they don't feel great about because they've got all of this stuff to unpack. Um, so, you know, that's another big thing. I mean, I think another thing that's kind of happened over the time that we've done this is that when we came on, we were one of the only sources of information. And the problem was largely that there wasn't enough information. Now we're kind of at the side where, I don't want to say that there's too much information, but there's so much information that especially for people without any kind of media literacy skills, figuring out what's accurate, what's not accurate, what's sound, what's not sound, is really difficult. And so we wind up having to do a lot of correcting where someone will come in and say they read this thing somewhere. And you know how it is when anybody kind of talks with any sense of authority. It's why I always believe everything you say. Um, <laughs> it's really dangerous for me to talk to Hannah because I'm like, she knows what she's talking about. Um, right? Yeah, this exactly. But you true. always sound like you know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, anybody's kind of writing with a sense of authority. And so they'll come in and they'll believe what they read was true because the way that it's written was that it's true. And that's, I think it's, it's, one piece of work to give people information who haven't had any information. It's a different job to have to kind of be doing remedial sex ed where you're having to go through a lot of conversations to get people to understand that a lot of what they've learned that they thought was true is either not true or it's lacking context or it's maybe true for some people, but it's not necessarily true for everybody. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I w just wanted to point out that with this international user base now, this really ups the ante on Scarletines being able to deliver not just culturally contextual and culturally sensitive information, but also um, information that will translate, mm -hmm. right, to, to different situations and different political Right. situations. So that's a that's an enormous Well, especially task. when you're talking about things like sex and the law, right? We have somebody that wants to come in and they have questions about abortion access. There's a lot of research yeah. <laughs> that has to happen to know what that is, but also the the laws are different everywhere. Everywhere. And birth control, I assume the same. And access, yeah, yeah. very and different access. everywhere. So one of the things that I, I know you and I have talked about a lot over the years, but I think it bears talking about in this context, because we are talking about feminism and health and social justice 
is that um, people who do the work that you do and the work that, that I have done in various capacities over the years, when you do sex education work, you bear witness to a lot of people's confusion, mm -hmm. um, their shame, mm -hmm. their worry, their fear, and also a lot of people's abuse histories. Mm -hmm. um, so how, for you, how do you hold all of that? How do you deal with all of that? I mean, you've been doing it for 20 years. Yeah, that's a while. Which is, uh, you know, a long time. And, and I have not known you to take very many breaks <laughs> from that. <laughs> um, often because you don't feel that you can. Sure. So um, how is it that you're not sort of sitting in a corner drooling on yourself? Right. Um, I have a lot of self-care. You know, there's... <laughs> There's a lot of self-care. I mean, I think that it's it's um, the the abortion clinic that I worked at for a while. I, one of the abortion providers would kind of often catch me after I was kind of everybody's counselor. Not you know, there's not counselors at abortion clinics. It's not to say that everyone needs psychological counseling. A counseling in an abortion clinic, if you're not familiar, is just somebody who tells you what's going to happen during the day, and if you have anything that you want to talk out or any feelings that you want to process, we're kind of there to just bear witness to those things and talk somebody through them. And again, maybe somebody's on, then on the fence and they're not sure about their decision, we can be there too to kind of help them figure out where that is. But suffice it to say, you know, in the process of that, usually someone will come a lot like with Scarletine and tell you what brought them there that day. And just like what brings you to an abortion on a given day, often what brings you to bringing very personal questions to someone that you don't know is not a great story. Um, there's, so, there's a lot of really hard stories that happen there. But I remember that provider would catch me in the hallway and usually what would happen is I would sit for somebody's stuff and I'd be cool and then I'd come out and I'd go in the back driveway and I would burst, I would cry, cry really hard, really fast for about 10 minutes. And so, you know, I mean, I think, I remember her saying, you need to not, you need to learn to not take in everybody's stuff quite that way. And I know that maybe for some people and for some people that do this work, that's the right way for them to do it is to kind of have up um, more shields when they do the work. For me, that's never really been the thing that feels right. The thing that feels right for me is to really kind of take it all in. And then after I've taken it all in, again, go for a run, have a cry, go scream into a pillow, go do whatever I need to do to kind of exercise that, um, exercise that thing. But it's, um, I don't know. I mean, there's, it's certainly, it's, it's stressful to take all that in and hold it, but it's also a privilege to take it all in and hold it in for somebody to put that kind of trust in you. And so I think also to just kind of, I don't know, just kind of knowing that goes a really long way, but I, you know, I talk a lot to a lot of people um, about what happens all the time. Our staff behind the scenes, Scarlet Scene is mostly volunteer, but we've got a bunch of back end channels. And so we are all in kind of constant conversation. All of us will have worries about any given person that we're talking through something at a time, but we were able to check in with each other and kind of, you know, there's something about when you're worried, being able to worry in a group, you know, to all really worry together goes a really long way in terms of feeling supported. In fact, we have one of our loyal volunteers here, <laughs> Lisa Phillips. She has been, she, you were around for the beginning. That's right. At the dawn of time. <laughs> Back in the dawn of time. <laughs> in the Pleistocene. Um, so I wanted to follow that cheerful question up with another <laughs> cheerful question, because we talked about this a little bit at dinner last night, as feminists doing feminist health and working with people, especially people in crisis, um, there's a huge need for these services. I mean, there's always way more need than there are people and, and hours in which to, to do this. And this, one of the things that I think we've both noticed over the years is that um, women and feminist women doing this work get exploited horrifically because we are willing to be there and do this work and to take this on. And, um, it, you know, this feeling that you're not, you're never allowed to take a vacation because what if somebody really needs you? Mm -hmm. um, what happens if you're not able to do enough? You know, um, the, the sense of responsibility 
Um, and, but also the, the sense that you're not allowed to stop while there's still a need. And I think that that, that type of exploitation often comes out of a, a place that is people wanting to do good, you know, people wanting to create change, people wanting to see a better world, which is wonderful. But um, if they're not the ones who are also, you know, pitching in and helping to, to carry that load, that can be really rough. And so I just wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit on, on how feminists and feminist activists end up exploiting other feminist activists sure. doing this work. I think another thing that I'll say is there's usually a very sharp class divide because a lot of what happens is that uh, feminists and people who support feminist movements who are upper class, the way that they support them is more often with money than with blood, sweat, and tears. And so if the way that you are supporting the activism is to provide the money, that's a very different situation than when your activism is to provide labor, often without the money. Um, so there's that. You know, a, a couple of years ago, I know I had a very troubling wake-up call because I noticed that something was happening with my staff where some of my staff were feeling very guilty about the amount, the amount of work that they were doing. And when I'd say, well, let's look at the amount of work that you're doing, and it would be quite a lot of work. And then I realized that they were getting the idea that the amount of work that they were doing should be the amount of work that I was doing. And I, it was like, oh, you know, and so I had to say, do not take me as an example of how much work to do and how much time to be working and how little time to take off because I'm a terrible example of that. Like, I, you know, I am. I, I, I've gotten better. I actually had to hire a coach a bunch of years ago to learn not to work 70 hours a week um, because no one should be doing that. <laughs> if, if, you can, if you have any other choice, you should not be doing that. It's not healthy. And so, I, you know, I also, I want to take a little bit of responsibility when it comes to this too, because I think that sometimes those of us that get in the, get in the habit of kind of working this way and thinking that we can't leave and thinking that we have to work, we set examples for everybody else around us that then it makes it that they don't feel real right, or they don't feel like they're a good activist if they're not working as hard as we are when really sometimes it's dysfunction that we're working as hard as we are. I mean, sometimes also, too, it's trying to avoid the judgment of other people. I mean, I think that's another one, especially when you help anyone who's any kind of marginalized. There's a lot of, there's a lot of messaging that you have to, like, you have to do it if you don't do it will do it. And one of the other ways that I learned to start asking that question was to say, well, you. Well, if I don't do it, you could do it. So why don't you do it? You know, and I think that's, a, that's another thing that it's always important to push back, because usually who's asking you that question are not willing to do the, the work <laughs> at the level that they're asking you to do yeah. it or insisting that you should. Yeah. Someone needs to do it, right. and therefore it should be you. Right. Because I'm talking to you. Right. Yeah. It's something that I've noticed um, that there are, you know, there's a, again, it's this very class-based thing where you have people who um, consider themselves political activists whose activism exists primarily in the form of writing a check. Right. Um, and then, of course, they all have opinions on how the work should be done. Right. To shift gears a little bit, um, you're an internet pioneer. And so they say. So they say, um, for good or ill. <laughs> and um, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the perceptions that people have of folks who make their living um, online or whose life's work has been involved with the internet is that they love the internet, that the internet is their, their beating heart that everything revolves around the internet. And um, I know that for, for my students, um, you know, digital natives, you know, the internet has always existed. It, it really is kind of a hub for their lives. Is it for you? No. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's, even when we started Scarlet Letters, a lot of the reason why we started it online is that printing and that printing was prohibitive, right? There was no money 
to print, and so there was this new thing, and I could learn to code it, and you know, it wasn't that hard to put together. There were a lot of accidents, many late night freakouts about things breaking, but by and large, you know, it was a th it was a thing that uh, it was a thing that we could do. I also kind of want to add. I think people always forget this. You know, when we started doing this stuff, there were not millions of people online. So to make mistakes, whether that mistake was a front page looking super janky or saying something funny, there weren't a million people watching. Right. Like we grew as the internet grew, and that's I I don't I don't know how I would do this if I were coming in with the way it is right now. I mean, it's not like you can't, you know, we have about usually 8 million people a year see Scarlet Team, but we've built that over a lot of years. But potentially, if you go and you do something and something goes viral, you could suddenly have people looking at your very first thing that you tried to do. And I remember um, us sitting there, you know, hand coding all of absolutely. those pages and trying to figure out how to get things to even line up. Freaking tables. You know. <laughs> So that it, it didn't look like we had done it as yeah. drunk as we actually were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, on dialogue. On dialogue. Right? True and a beep. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, like, I, I very reluctantly used the internet to do this. And, you know, I recognize that, of course, it's given us a vehicle. There's no way, obviously, that I could be an international. We couldn't be doing international sex ed any other way. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of freedom that it's given us because, again, it's not that it doesn't cost anything, but certainly compared to print and other ways of doing things, it's not necessarily prohibitive, especially when you're willing to stay up all night and do the thing. But, you know, when the internet first started developing as like a library dork, I remember being excited thinking, oh my God, it's like a big library. It's like the biggest library. This is the very best thing. Um, and it's not like a big library anymore. Like it's not, you know, my vision of what it would turn into of this giant, super amazing library full of wonderful things and not spam and advertising everywhere. Um, is not has not been met. The internet is not my favorite thing. Often when I'm not working, I'm not online. Um, I think the only message board I've ever participated in is ours mm -hmm. for work. Um, and uh, yeah, I would much rather usually turn stuff off and and read and write books. This last month, I took the like very first month off of Scarletine I've ever taken off the whole time that we've done it to start writing my next book and was able to mostly have my computer to write things but not be online at all. And it was really nice. I highly recommend it uh, if you can do it. What's this offer that you've made about the phone? I, yeah, no, I, I have offered some of my students um, uh, extra credit for giving me their phone for two weeks. No one has yet taken me up on it. You should take her up on it. Yeah, it would be good. It's good. It's really liberating. I promise. It's really um, liberating. It, it is, actually. It's pretty fantastic. It is. But um, no one wants to believe that. That's okay. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the books. So this gorgeous thing here is in its second edition, which means that the first edition was so amazing that they wanted you to do it again and make it better and bigger in all of the ways. And then there is this one that has just come out, which is also fantastico and super cute, by the way. All, it's, it's a graphic novel, so it's awesome. Um, so how, how, in your head, how does the book writing work with the, the online? How do those things work together or, or not? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the... I think the thing with Scarlettine all along is I'll usually kind of say to people that, you know, if you don't know anything about Montessori, in Montessori, you, you don't decide what your students do. You're not like, we're all going to do this this day. What you do is you see what the kids are picking up and using and you, you observe them and then you kind of make decisions based on either what they ask you in terms of their interests or what they're showing you in terms of their skills and abilities. And that's, you know, that's really one of the reasons that we've always done Scarletine this way. People ask us questions, that's how we decide the content that we're gonna do. We don't decide the content we're gonna do because the CDC says we should do it or because some institution that's funding us says this is what we're funding this year. We decide the content that we put there 
based on what is said in our direct services. So to me, our, our direct services feel a lot like a lab school, right, for sex ed. People come in, we talk to them, we not only learn what people want from their questions, but then we also interact with them. So we get to kind of test out different approaches. And of course, I, you know, I get to correct if I'm talking to somebody and I explain a thing a certain way and they say that didn't make any sense at all to me. I get to go again. I'd be like, let me try this other way of doing it. Or, you know, we talk with somebody and I think I have a good approach, but it just, it's not, it doesn't seem to stick. So the next time somebody else asks me that thing, I can try it in a different way. And I think, you know, a lot of the times when I talk to other people doing any kind of educational book, they have to make focus groups. I don't have to make a focus, and it's of like 10 people, right? Like it's tiny. Um, I don't have to make a focus group. We, we have very big focus groups all the time that are built in. And so that's really, you know, that's a, that's a nice thing that we have in order to be able to do this. But it's also too being, you know, I, I came into this as a writer, you know, I was already writing and one of the things that differentiates Scarletine from a lot of, you know, now there's a lot more sex ed is that we still write prose pieces that are well written and engaging and good pieces of creative writing, not just, you know, a bunch of bullet lists with some introductory text and then some summary text and a little bit of filler in between just so you don't nod off in the middle. Um, so, you know, I, I still get a, I still get a write, uh, which is nice. But the book process, it's a little bit, it's nicer to write books sometimes because, of course, with Scarletine, what I'm saying and how I'm doing really depends on anybody's need on a given day. So I can't plan to do a thing, it's entirely possible that all of my plans can just get shot to hell if somebody comes in with a burning need or we're extra busy that day. And the nice thing about books, of course, is that I can turn all of that off and just write. So in 20 years and change of doing sex ed, what's the thing you've learned about sexuality that's been the most important for your life? Huh, that's interesting. You know, I, I, th I think that one of the things is just not getting, it's very hard for me to see people being really, again, really kind of caught up in shame, really concerned that, um, you know, things that they, things that they want aren't right, something's wrong with who they are as a person because of things that they want or things they feel like. It's really to kind of sit on the other side and observe how much it just, you know, it literally cripples people sometimes to do that and how much it gets in the way of their happiness and how much it gets in the way of figuring out what they actually want and what they actually need. And so, you know, in some way kind of going through that has given me a lot of permission to be extra gentle with myself. Um, about those things, and I'm not particularly gentle with myself about most things. Um, you know, so that's, you know, that's one thing. I mean, I think another thing, too, is just not, uh, culturally particularly, I feel like sex and sexuality always gets put in the, like, oh, that's private, you know, the only people that you're supposed to talk to about this are people that you're in some kind of sexual encounter or sexual relationship with and otherwise Nobody talks to anybody about it. Um, and even though, you know, my friends are not teenagers, I'll be 50 next year, so they're not usually teenagers. But I, you know, it's still the, the people closer to my age, it's very obvious to me that they usually still need to have somebody to talk with about all of this, that we all still need to have somebody to talk with about all of this. And it's, it's, it's important that we do. Um, especially too when you, you know, you're talking about the hard stuff that happens. We, I think a lot of people don't think of sex ed as doing things, as guiding people through things post-assault, as guiding people through getting out of abusive relationships. And a lot of the reasons, especially with abusive relationships, that people will get so trapped in them is silence, right? Is a lack of talking and being honest about what's really happening and what's really going on and the shame of it, right? Of saying things that you might not feel great, 
that they've been part of your life experience and you might not feel like how you feel or what you want makes you look good. And so you might not say anything about it, but that it's, it's important for you, me, to, to say those things as much for myself as for anybody else. And speaking of the things that we often don't talk about, the new book is about menopause. It is about menopause. So how did that happen? I've been in perimenopause for seven years, and I haven't killed anyone yet. But so, the night is young. Yet. Um, so yeah, so I figure I can maybe help other people not kill people um, with this. It's funny, though, because... Um, it's one of those things that we really don't have any content on in scarletine, which is kind of bonkers because a lot of people will have hysterectomies and will go into perimenopause and menopause. So we should, we should have this information on there. And it's another one of these areas where my heart hurts so bad for every trans man that has to go through menopause right now and has absolutely nothing that he can pick up that doesn't misgender him the whole entire time. Um, and so it's, you know, kind of where I sit with this is a lot of where I felt like I sat with Scarletine, which is that it's not just that the information itself isn't out there, and it is, but not a whole lot of it. It's that the approach to the information that's out there serves a very specific slice of human being <laughs> the whole rest of us on the outside of this that also need resources deserve to be able to re need resources that include us in those resources that we don't have to kind of be doing this auto translate of while we're reading it to right. have it be relevant to us right shifting all the pronouns absolutely all the absolutely or body parts or right. i can't tell you how many of those books i've picked up that literally in the first chapter it tells me about the impact of menopause on my marriage, which I don't have, right? Like, but it's very sure that I'm married because apparently only married people uh, go into menopause. Yeah, and and all of those, and everybody who's going through menopause has heterosexual penetrative Yes, sex. absolutely. If I made you the sex ed empress of the world right now, <laughs> and you could pick five things to just drop effortlessly into the minds of everybody all over the world about sexuality, what would you teach them? Everyone needs to be asked if they want to do things, right? Consent is not just about one gender of people or one group of people. Everyone, And it's not even that everyone, I didn't say everyone needs to be asked. Everyone actually wants to be asked. And when people want to do something, it's not a buzzkill to be asked to do something. That's like, if you really like cake, and I'm like, hey, do you want some cake? You're not like, don't talk to me about cake. That doesn't make me hungry, right? Like, then you want more cake when I say that. Everybody likes to be asked to do things that they want to do. And when they don't want to do things, it's everyone needs to be asked to do things so that they can say no. Um, desires are not actions. I think that's another thing that we get around a lot of shame. A lot of people have sexual desires for things that either make them feel uncomfortable or that they know that in reality would not be safe or would be harmful to other people, and they feel terrible about them, and they're eating up inside, but they're thoughts. They're just thoughts. They're not, nobody's doing, no one's hurting anyone with their thoughts. And so kind of the second piece of that is that sexual fantasies and feelings of desires, they're, they're not actions. They all by themselves, they don't hurt anyone. They don't have the capacity to harm anyone. Um, what you want is okay, as long as it's, as long as it's okay with anybody else that you might involve um, in that situation. Don't wait to ask questions that you really need the answers to. Especially I think that one thing that we see sometimes is a lot of people that feel like if they don't feel totally ready for something or they don't have all of the information or whatever that the clock is ticking and they need to absolutely do a thing at the first opportunity they have even if they're not sure about it, even if they have questions about it, I think um, kind of the second piece of that is that every opportunity is not a great opportunity. I, we saw it when we were together. There's a lot of people that think they haven't had sexual relationships or interactions with somebody yet, and the very first person that invites them, they think, oh God, if I don't say yes to this, no one will ever ask me again. Someone will always ask you again. They always will.
way more than one person probably. So if possibly if, in a really annoying right, number of it, it, true enough. If the if the first, second, third, whatever opportunity you get isn't the opportunity you want, don't take it. The, there will be other opportunities. And I and I also do think I think there's a I think we'd all like to think wherever we come from that we don't have a lot of shame or baggage or rough feelings about sex and sexuality, but we all live in this world and so we, we all do. Like we all have a lot of work that we need to do around things. That doesn't make us broken, that doesn't make us damaged, that doesn't make us stupid, there's nothing pathetic. I mean everybody's always really judgy when they're in a space where they feel like um, they're not liberated. That's kind of another mm -hmm. phrase of mine that I absolutely cannot stand is when people say that somebody isn't comfortable with something sexually, that they're repressed and they're not liberated. It is liberated to say no to a thing that you don't want. Um, there's nothing repressed about not being into something that you're just not into. Yeah, I mean, I've had this we've had this conversation a lot and I've had this conversation with a lot of other people that the point of being sex positive is that you can you know, it, embrace and enjoy the things that you want. Not that you must embrace and enjoy all of the things all of the time. Right. And I think that that's often really badly misinterpreted. I agree. 